Our study is Session 3 in Lifeway, the study of Proverbs and the Song of Solomon. Our text is Proverbs chapter 3, verse 21 to 35. And the lesson summary truth for this lesson, Compassion Demonstrated, is that following God's wisdom is demonstrated in how a person treats others. I would suggest starting the lesson along these lines. Bob, Bob is out making visits for his church on Thursday evening. He's going to visit the Smiths who have been attending the church for the last three Sundays. They've been driving that past suburban church to get to downtown church. He's pretty confident they're going to join their church, but he's running late. So he decides to take a shortcut to get there on time. It's a little bit sketchy part of town, so he locks the doors just to feel more safe. He turns onto a street and as, he, as his headlights shine down the street, he sees two men standing over a third man who's lying on the ground. Because of his headlights, they scatter and run off. And Bob hesitates for a moment, trying to decide what to do. Then he, and I've asked the class to complete that. What would be some possibilities for Bob's decision at that time? The chapter 3 is teaching us about wisdom. And it says that wisdom will lead to the good life. The father's telling the son there are three things that required for him to live the good life. The first is wisdom will teach him to trust God. That's verses 1 to 12. And then also wisdom will teach him to value wisdom. That's verse 13 through 20, which is not a part of our Sunday school lesson, <clears throat> but Solomon says, wisdom is more valuable than having money. So seek after wisdom. It's that valuable. And the third thing he says that will lead him to the good life is wisdom will teach him to be kind to others. Now that is amazingly simple, but profound in its truth. Trust God value wisdom, and be kind to others. Those are three things the father says to the son that will lead him to a good life. Now, Jesus took these things and he reduced them to two things. He said, love God and love others. The lesson truth is a good diagnostic tool. The lesson truth, again, is following God's wisdom is demonstrated in how person treats others. For example, how can I know if I'm following God's wisdom? Well, just look at how you're treating others, and that will reveal whether you are following God's wisdom or not. How can I treat people with godly wisdom, whatever the situation? Well, treat people as God would have you treat them, with love and respect and kindness and that will guide you as well. All of this comes together to build a peaceful community uh, worth living in. To a large degree, the success and happiness we enjoy in life depends on our relationships with others. And we need God's wisdom to know how to treat others. The first point of our lesson is confidence gained. And just a a summary. Let me give you a summary of it before I ask the class, someone in the class, to read verses 21 to 26. I believe that what's being stated here is God is the guarantor of positive things predicted for the wise person who obeys and trusts God. God is the guarantor of the positive things predicted for the wise person who obeys and trusts God. And our confidence is gained as we experience the results of obeying God. So as you practice trusting God and practice obeying God, the outcome is you have this growing confidence in God bringing about this kind of life. Now in verses 21 to 22, the father says there are two qualities the son needs that will keep him safe. And every parent is concerned about the safety of his child. 
And the Father says, if you will maintain these two qualities, the idea of maintaining is there's a consistent part of your life. Also, the idea of maintaining is it's not something that you forget. It's something that you continue to do throughout your life. It's not a quality that you gain and then you go on to other qualities. This is something that you must hold before you all the time. And I ask the class, what are those two qualities the Father says the Son must have in order to live a life of success and safety? And of course, the answer is sound wisdom and discretion. And ask the class how their personal study guide defined those two terms, wisdom and discretion. Now, wisdom is this idea of uh, having these inner resources to deal with the fluctuations of life. I'd call it the MacGyver principle. It's a person who can take whatever the events are around them and they'll know how to respond in the best way. That's sound wisdom. It's expert use of life's events. The, the term discretion has about it uh, a person who can think through the consequences of their actions and as a result they make the most effective decision about how to live. So sound wisdom is this ability to take the events of life, whatever they are, good or bad, and make the right decision about it. Discretion is the ability to see the consequences of those actions. Now he's saying to his son, don't lose sight of them. That's the same thing, just stated differently, that this is something that needs to be maintained. It needs to become a consistent part of your life. I don't know of any other way, uh, at least it's the simplest way, to maintain sound wisdom and discretion are just the simple, regular disciplines, spiritual disciplines. Things like reading the Bible brings you back to this idea of sound wisdom and discretion. Consistent times of prayer in relationship with God as His Spirit speaks to you. Regular church attendance and attending Sunday school. <clears throat> Those are ways in which the Holy Spirit uses to help us to maintain sound wisdom and discretion. People who do not keep those kinds of regular, consistent spiritual disciplines are the ones who seem to step away and lose sight of these things. He provides motivation for his son in verse 23 through 25. And I would, uh, again, ask the someone in the class to read those verses and then say, how could we summarize this? What is it that the, the father's really driving at in this? Him, he's talking about uh, during the daytime, wisdom will help you not to stumble, not to fall, not to have failure. It, at nighttime, you won't be afraid. There's a sense of security when you're at your most vulnerable. He talks about in verse 25, sudden danger when the tragedies of life fall upon you sound wisdom and discretion will help you during those times to make the best decisions in the most painful experiences of life which we all will go through so what is it what is it that the father is saying to this son what's the motivation for maintaining sound wisdom and discretion I would suggest to you that one of the things he's saying is, son, when you face the challenges of life and you are going to have challenges in life, sound wisdom and discretion will keep you safe and keep you confident where you're not fearful, where you're not concerned uh, and anxious about these things. You have a confidence in your relationship and your security found in God. Now, verse 26, he gives the reason for this confidence to be gained. And again, I asked someone to read that. And what he is saying is the Lord is the one who provides for your protection. For the Lord, and notice the word Lord is the capital letters, and which talks about Yahweh, the covenant-keeping God. The Lord will be your confidence and will keep your foot from the snare. Now, he's making here a direct connection between walking in wisdom and walking with God. And as you walk with God, as your, as your relationship with God remains close, then you begin to see the safety 
and the wisdom of walking with God. And as you consistently do that, your confidence grows. You gain confidence. So here's a couple of ideas to maybe apply this kind of lesson. Suppose uh, you, uh, your child is marrying and here's the newlyweds in front of you. And you've gotten to one of those times where you can have an honest conversation. Now you're far down the road from being a newlywed and you know the fluctuations of life that can occur between those first days of marriage and those days later when you're sending your children out into the world. There's lots of things that happen there. Lots of good things. Lots of painful things. And so how would you how would you use this passage to counsel those newlyweds to say that you don't need to be fearful of the scary things in front of you? And there probably are some scary things. Things like a loss of a job. Or there might be health issues that come. Or there might be difficulties in the raising of children. Heartbreaking things. How does this passage help you walk with wisdom and discretion through those days? How would you use this to counsel them? On the other hand, maybe uh, you're a retiree, your class is retirees. How would retirees talk to middle-aged, uh, young, uh, middle-aged adults using this passage? And my point is, is I'm just trying to say this has, this does prepare us to understand that we can move forward into a future of uncertainty with confidence. And it's rooted in your relationship with God. And that's what gives us sound wisdom. And that's what gives us dis discretion, discernment. Now, our confidence in God and His ways is critical when it comes to treating others. If you are sound and secure in your relationship with God, that has a tremendous impact on the way you're going to relate with other people. You're not so threatened by uh, their responses to you. you. You don't necessarily have to defend yourself. You don't necessarily have to come back with them in the same way they came with you because they're not the ones that give you your confidence and security. Your confidence and your security is in God. That has a huge impact on the way you treat others. So the second point of this lesson is kindness expressed, verse 27 to 30. Following God's wisdom <clears throat> is demonstrated in how a person treats others. And when someone's following God's wisdom, they treat people with kindness. The, the Father tells you what to do in verse 27 to 28. And the Father tells the Son what not to do in verse 29 to 30. So I ask someone to read verse 27 to 28. And then I just simply ask, what is the Father talking about when He says good? Don't withhold good from the one to whom it belongs. What's the good that He's talking about? And it could be a number of things that the class could be, talk they could be talking about. It could be money. It could be that uh, this is a laborer. He's worked for the day and he deserves to be paid. They were paid every day and that day and time. Uh, it could be uh, expertise and a skill that your neighbor needs from you. It could be physical aid. It could be tools, for example. And, of course, in our context, in the days that we're experiencing, it could be justice. Don't withhold justice from your neighbor when he deserves it. Uh, um, how does the story of the Good Samaritan illustrate verse 27 through 28, and ask the class to discuss that. A group, I think, uh, that needs kindness expressed in our day are police officers. In our church, we have two young men who are on the police force in our community. And uh, this morning when I came to prayer meeting with uh, a group of men, a police officer was sitting in our parking lot, and I went over and introduced myself and... and uh, asked him how we could pray for him. And the police officer said, if you don't mind praying for our department, uh, it's a little bit difficult 
morale's a little low. He said, I think we have a good police department. We work real hard at trying not to commit some of the things that have been uh, happening in the news. But he said, our men are pretty discouraged right now. And I assured this officer that's exactly what we would do. And I'm sure he's expressing how these two young men in our church. So I'm going to give my class cards and ask them to just jot a note or a prayer or a scripture verse to these two men. And then I'm going to collect them and I'll put them in envelopes and uh, give those to the families. I, I don't want to mail them out to the men. Uh, they, they may feel a little bit uh, vulnerable that way but uh, just as a way to express kindness. That's, that's an idea for our, my class. In verse, I asked, people, asked someone to read verse 29 to 30. <clears throat> and then I just simply say, would, would someone tell us who's, who's the best neighbor you ever had? And maybe if I'd solicit one or two responses there. And then I'd ask, who's the worst neighbor you ever had? And again, select one or two, maybe three if there's time, uh, the worst neighbors. And and when they're describing the worst neighbors, then I would use that to look at verse 29 to 30 to see if what they're describing can be found in the things that we're not supposed to do. This word plan, don't plan any harm, is an interesting word. It literally means to cut with a plow. It was describing plowing a field or cutting metal. And when it was applied to thinking, it's the idea of clearing away the fog, to use another metaphor, um, so that you could uh, clearly plan an action. But of course, in this action, it is evil. So someone who is, who's making a plan to do harm uh, to their neighbor. He said, that is not expressing kindness. Sound wisdom and discretion acts towards others so that it produces peaceful community living. That's the whole idea that's happening, I believe, in these verses about kindness expressed. When you do this, it, it has an outcome. It, it produces peaceful community living. Foolishness disrupts peaceful community living. And all you have to do is turn on the evening news to see the foolishness that's disrupting communities in our day and time. Now, the lesson summary statement seems to be very sound wisdom for our day. Listen to it again. Following God's wisdom is demonstrated in how a person treats others. Lastly, blessing secured, verses uh, 31 to 35. There are times when it looks like following wisdom doesn't work uh, like we think it should, and that following the ways of evil can lead to short-term success. Uh, but be certain of this, judgment will fall. God opposes evil people. You may not prosper now, but you will later. This is God's world. And if you believe that this is God's world, then the right decision, the wise decision, is to believe the promises of God that He will keep His promise and follow the ways of wisdom. Because it is God's world, your blessings are secured. I'd ask the men, and as we read through this, I'd like for the men in the class to find the descriptions of the wicked and what are the consequences of their life. And I would write these on the board. As we read through it, I'm asking the women, would you find the descriptions of the righteous and what are the consequences of their decisions? And then I'd put those on the board because what I'm wanting to set up is this tremendous contrast that is shown in this text about the blessings secured. Let's just look at some of them. For the devious, for the violent and the devious, in verse 31 and 32, it says they are detestable to the Lord. It's the strongest way he could write about God's rejection of these people. Uh, other versions use an abomination to God. 
And yet, the one who is upright is a friend of God. And that word friend literally talks about two people sitting close together. It's, it, uh, some translations use the word secret. God will share his secrets. But it's, it's the idea of two people in, in uh, intimate conversation with one another. Now look at the contrast of that. For the devious, that's someone who takes the wrong path. This person is, is rejected by God. It's strongly rejected by God. But for the upright, that's the person who takes the right path. What is the consequence for that person? He becomes a close confidant with God. Can you think of any greater contrast than that? He goes on to say in verse 33, the Lord's curse is on the household of the wicked. The idea of a curse is the withdrawing of God's presence and power and, and leaving a person bound in whatever the choice is that he's made. A curse represents the judgment and the punishment of God upon a household. And then the word blessing refers to the goodness of the Lord. So the Lord's curse is on the household of the wicked, but, the, but his blessings on the home of the righteous. Can, can you imagine again this kind of this kind of opposite. Here's one household who, who God in a sense has evacuated in the sense that He's removed His blessing, He's removed His power, He's judging and punishing that house. And over here, here's a household He's was pouring good upon. And notice that it's plural, it's household and it's home. And that is just simply to say an individual believer's, or an indiv excuse me, an individual's behavior uh, has repercussions for those around them. And we see many, many examples of that. But do you see the strong contrast that's being made? And then in verse 34 and 35, there's the mocker and the humble. And uh, the fool, he says, he holds up to dishonor. This word holds up is a, is a uh, worship word. It's, it's talking about a sacrifice. And, and what it, it's... it's uh, he holds this person up as an offering of shame to the community. Can you, can you imagine that? Well, uh, he states them in such a definite way that he wants the son to understand their, their properties may be more valuable than yours. Their homes may be nicer than yours. Their health may be better than yours. Their Bank accounts may be larger than yours, but understand, son, a divine curse hangs on their life. And just as sure as God will bless the wise, He will bring judgment on the unwise. If we believe that wisdom will make good on these promises, then by all means, pursue wisdom. And pursuing wisdom ultimately means you're pursuing the presence of God, the person of God. The way I intend to close the lesson is I'm going to give our, my class a, a coin. This happens to be a nickel, what I have in my pocket. Um, but I'm going to give them a coin and point out that uh, the coin represents that before us we have two choices. We can either choose, say, heads, which would be choosing God's way, or tails, which may be choosing to go uh, our way. And, and what I want them to do with this coin is to put it somewhere where they'll see it this week and, and to remember this choice. Now here's what's going to happen. Sometime, maybe soon, maybe later, someone's going to do something and it's going to hurt you, it's going to make you angry, it's going to wound you. Now you have a choice. Now it may be that you're the kind of person that when that happens, you respond in fear and you just separate yourself from the person. You pout. Um, you withdraw. That's not necessarily God's way of doing things, you know. The other person may be someone that you pounce. You come right back intending to wound and hurt the way you were. And that's not necessarily God's way of reacting to. You have a choice. You, you can either treat the other person with wisdom the way God wants you to, or you can choose the world's way. And what I want you to understand is, is the choice to follow God's way is going to build community. 
It's going to build peace in that relationship. Now that may mean a very straight, hard talk, but you treat people with wisdom and the outcome is, the potential outcome is community. You choose not to go God's way, it's disruptive of community. The other thing is, the blessing that's waiting for you is enormous. God will bless your efforts when you treat people in the way of wisdom. It's a wonderful lesson, a powerful lesson that causes us to be more dependent upon God for His strength, for His wisdom, for His guidance. And this is what you want for you and your class. God bless you. May God use you as you teach His Word this Sunday.